Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for the inaugural webinar of Pivot to Peace, which is titled Why We Need a Pivot to Peace, Not War with China. My name is Sheila Shao. I am a research analyst with the California Community Colleges, as well as a grassroots activist and organizer. We are thrilled to be speaking with you all today. Uh, we are honored to host this webinar with many great speakers to talk about Pivot to Peace, our mission, and why the public should support this effort. Upon announcing this webinar, we received many requests for this event to be translated in Chinese so that it would uh, reach a wider audience. So we wanted to just make a note that while this was originally planned to be live streamed, we've accommodated the request for translation by pre-recording in advance. So if you haven't already, please take this moment uh, to share this live stream on your social media pages so that we can reach a wider audience. Pivot to Peace is a coalition of people from all walks of life who came together concerned about the reorientation of US military and foreign policy that identifies China as a competitor and adversary. We have seen the escalation of conflict with China through means of anti-China demonization campaigns, the trade wars, attacks on Chinese foreign international students, and anti-Chinese racism that has been amplified by the COVID-19 crisis. We are public sector workers, lawyers, students, veterans, academics, healthcare workers, and so forth, who are committed to mobilizing the public opinion that we do not want any more war, especially not with China. We reject the escalation toward glo uh, global conflict and instead urge for peace and cooperation with China. Currently, mainstream media in the US is full of biases and distortions who foster hatred among the American population against the People's Republic of China, Chinese people, and Chinese Americans. We seek to provide a platform that is fair and open about information about China and its economic, social, and political affairs. Above all else, we want global peace and friendship, especially in the current period of COVID-19 and this pandemic, global cooperation is a critical uh, necessity to defeat the virus once and for all. The US has a lot to learn from countries who have successfully minimized the damage of COVID-19. The urgency of this work cannot be understated. Since the onset of COVID-19, we've seen an exponential increase in anti-Asian hate crimes fostered by the racist scapegoating rhetoric by the Trump administration. According to Stop Hate AAPI, there have been over 1,800 reported incidents of anti-Asian hate crimes this year alone. And of course, just like many statistics, this number is likely undercounted. Chinese foreign international students have been subjected to surveillance advised by the FBI in over 60 universities across the country for fear of being quote unquote agents of China. There have been many cases even before COVID-19 uh, of these international students being detained at customs while arriving in the US for school. Now, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, has reported that it will not renew visas for international students who enroll in university programs that are uh, fully operated online. Of course, many of those who will be affected are Chinese international students. The anti-China hysteria has even affected scientists and academics. Uh, I just read a report where 54 um, of these scientists have been fired or resigned uh, for being accused of having ties with foreign governments. 93% of these cases investigated uh, were so-called tied to possible funding from China. Scientists are being persecuted for allegedly having these ties. And these are just kind of a few egregious examples of how the new military doctrine um, cast China as a great adversary of the US has really affected thousands of innocent lives. So for today's program, uh, you know, we're bringing together a diverse panel of experts and leaders, each of whom will address our topic, the need to pivot to peace rather than war with China. By focusing on a particular aspect of this complex subject, each of the talks will, will be brief. I am honored to begin our program with Julie Tang. 
Julie Tang is a retired Superior Court judge in San Francisco and the co-chair of the Comfort Women Justice Coalition. She has been an instrumental part of the Pivot to Peace work and she will be discussing how the anti-China rhetoric has inflamed racism against Asian Americans in the US. Thank you, Sheila. I'm very proud to join in with my fellow Americans to present a different perspective on US-China relations. Our position is not one that you hear of or read about every day from the mainstream media, because these days you only hear negative things about China. Well, in the US, 80% of our media is owned and controlled by a few corporations, six of them in total, but they have their own agenda, of course. But today we hope you will keep an open mind and hear a different perspective on US-China issues from us. We are a small voice, but we are the voices of many Asians, Blacks, Caucasians, Muslims, Latinos, and LGBTQ communities who are united in one belief that the direction which our government is taking brings us dangerously close to war with China and is wrong. For my part, I will focus my discussion on how our government's policies are affecting Chinese Americans adversely. The recent killing of George Floyd by a white policeman reminded me and many Chinese Americans of a brutal murder of a Chinese American man named Vincent Chin that happened in 1982 in Detroit, Michigan. Vincent Chin was killed by two white unemployed auto workers who mis mistook him for Japanese from Japan. They blamed him for the unemployment in the US auto industry because Americans were at that time shunning US made cars for Japanese cars, which are cheaper and more efficient. The two white men were convicted of murder and sentenced by a white male judge to pay a small fine and put on probation without serving one day in prison. Vincent's murder, murder has since become a rallying call for racial and judicial justice for Chinese Americans. It is now 2020 and it is China's turn to be blamed for a loss of jobs in the US when American corporations moved their manufacturing to China for better profits. And when the pandemic hit the US, President Trump failed to protect Americans, but he used China as a scapegoat and incites racial hysteria by using slurs such as Chinese virus and Kung flu. The Chinese Americans felt the sting of the demonizing of China in the press and by the administration. Some argued that Chinese Americans should not be conflated with China or its people and urged Americans to separate Chinese Americans from China. I even heard a speaker recently from a webinar on racism against Asians, sponsored by APA, that Americans should blame the Chinese Communist Party and not China. These kinds of political juxtapositions are naive and damaging to our fight against racism at home. Because history and facts have shown that the rights and welfare of Chinese Americans are inextricably tied to the volatile relations between China and the US and promoting anti-communist hysteria is an old trick that brought us the last Cold War with China in the 40s in which Chinese Americans were the major victims in America. When news of the virus hit China in January 2020, and before the shelter-in took place, Chinese American-owned businesses such as restaurants and retails fell 70%. Hate crimes against Asian Americans took a sharp rise. They reported physical assaults, spitting, name-calling, and children being bullied in schools. Director of FBI Christopher Wray, who was appointed by Trump, considered every Chinese person in the US, especially the researchers and scientists, a part of a quote unquote, whole of society spying for China. Anti-China, anti-immigrant hysteria is pervasive throughout the, the Trump administration and its discriminatory and racist effects do not distinguish Chinese Americans from China. The Congress currently has 100 bills pending, all targeting China with sanctions for how China governs its people and how it deals with its own domestic problems. These bills sound morally righteous, 
based on the premise that America has the duty and moral authority to dictate to China and other countries how to govern their own country. Many of you know about the National Security Act that was recently adopted by the Hong Kong government. Our president and the US Congress responded immediately by issuing sanctions against Hong Kong and China. But did you know that about 2.9 million Hong Kong residents signed a petition in support of the National Security Act? Of course not, because Americans mainstream media does not report things like this. These signatures by Hong Kong people carry the hope that some semblance of peace could be restored back to Hong Kong after murder, destruction, and rioting by the protesters that reigned terror over Hong Kong for the entire year of 2019 and continuing. A majority of the Hong Kong people wanted their peace and normalcy back. And maybe we should let Hong Kong, which is a region of China and other countries, resolve their own domestic problems. And maybe our president and Congress could spend more time then in dealing with our own domestic issues, such as the pandemic, racism, and the huge disparity between the rich and the poor. According to the polls, Americans have never viewed China more negatively now than now. Roughly two thirds or 66% of Americans have an unfavorable view of China, up nearly 20% points since Trump took office. This kind of sentiment carries huge implications for a climate ripe for war with China, which should be a great concern for all Americans. Now, can a new administration, such as one led by Mr. Biden, the Democratic Party challenger to Trump, change the narrative on China? Can he do better for Americans and make lives easier for Chinese Americans who have to live with the fallout from a US-China discourse, our communities are asking. We need a roadmap to peace and not war. We need genuine leadership in this country, not politicians panning to the voters. And we need courage as a country to acknowledge the world order may be different, but war is never the answer. And with determination and support from a president, who has the courage to change the terrible state that we're in, we may be able to turn the conflicts with China to our advantage without the need to go to war with China. And fundamentally, can we be strong enough to respect China's right to sovereignty over her regions as we expect her to, res to respect ours? If we insist on peace, we will get peace. If we, if we insist on war, we will get war. Can we choose peace together? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie. Next, I am honored to introduce Mr. Ding Bong Li. Mr. Li is the president of the San Francisco Chinese Benevolent Association and the president of the Chinese Six Companies. Mr. Li will be talking about the urgency felt by the Chinese community for peace between the United States and China. Dr. Sheila, uh, I will speak Mandarin also. 和平是人类最美好的愿望，尤其是在现在仍陷于战乱而流离失所、饥寒交迫的国家与人民，更像是在黑暗中盼望黎明、苦旱中期待甘露，令人渴望。近年来，由于中美两国的贸易纷争、新
，美国是当今世界上的超级强国，在过往的历史上，每一个关键的时刻，都起了伸张正义、维护和平的巨大作用。在世界人民的心目中，仍然是以捍卫自由民主与维持和平的守护神。而中国则是一个正在发展中的国家，更需要在和平稳定的环境下面继续建设。同时，中国也是一个守护型的国家。中国人民是一个爱好和平的民族，远在两千五百年前就修筑了万里长城，抵御外族的侵略。八百多年前的明朝万人远洋舰队。遍访南洋、印度洋以及非洲海岸，二十年间从来没有在海外留下一支军队，设立一个殖民地，无他，因为他是一个爱好和平的民族，没有侵略性的基因。所以，我作为一个恢复和平的一员，我希望我们的美国决策阶层。多为世界和平的前途着想，支持和平的政策，对外尊重每一个国家的主权，互不干涉内政，多多沟通，消除歧见，和平共处，尽量消除迫害和平的诱因，以全人类的共同愿望，世界和平为终极目标，对内阻止仇视中国的议案。团结各个族裔，反对歧视，营造一种祥和的气氛，以利于国力的永续发展，为世界和平做出应有的贡献。这就是我们的愿望。谢谢大家的聆听，谢谢施啊。Thank you, Mr. Lee.、Um, next, I would like to invite up Ken Hammond. Ken is a professor of East Asian and Global History at New Mexico State University. Ken will be discussing the new U.S. military doctrine. Please welcome Ken. Thank you, Sheila. Pivot to Peace is a response to the rising tide of hostility towards China in the United States. On the part of the American government, there's been a series of phases of development of this, that spanned both the Obama and now the Trump administration. And the latest version of this, the latest articulation of this, was in a document issued on May 20th, called the U.S. Strategic Approach to the People's Republic of China. And、this is a it's a very interesting document, 16 pages laying out American official policy,、uh, perceptions of China, and、uh, a program for addressing what、uh, it presents as as its concerns. And basically, it's a portrayal of China as a threat, as an aggressive and expansive power,、uh, undermining the position of the United States. When we read this document,、uh, there's a kind of feel of, of an almost Orwellian doublespeak going on because the document essentially projects onto China、uh, the same kinds of motives and and uh, and uh, actions that have characterized American international conduct、uh, for many many decades. It is the United States, after all. Which has a globe-spanning network of military bases, including bases encircling China.、Uh, it is the United States which has sought, especially since the end of World War II, to impose its own norms on the global community in terms of business operations, financial interactions, even technologies, as the、uh, conflict over、uh, Huawei and 5G technologies uh, uh, symbolizes today. And the United States has has arrogated to itself for a long time the right to police the world, to enforce American interests and American、uh, ideas about a properly ordered world、uh, on peoples all around the planet. 
The reality of China is rather different. The reality of China is that China has always articulated under the People's Republic uh, positions of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries and mutual respect for territorial integrity. China has concentrated for the last 70 years on, on its domestic development, on enhancing the lives of its own people, and it has uh, focused primarily on uh, the elimination of poverty and on economic development, lifting over 800 million people out of poverty into a better life, the greatest campaign of improvement in human livelihood in history. Seeing China as, a, as an adversary, as, a, as, a, as an enemy, this is just not in line with China's actual conduct and behavior in the world. The United States continues to promote its own campaigns of interference, uh, distorting the realities of life in China, uh, interfering in places like Tibet and Xinjiang, actively uh, uh, in being involved in, in promoting uh, public unrest and, and uh, dissent in, in uh, Hong Kong through agencies like the uh, National Endowment for Democracy and by imposing its own military standards, including the so-called uh, freedom of navigation, uh, provocative uh, voyages in the South China Sea. The U.S. Uh, strategic approach to the People's Republic document lays out a, a program that uh, involves all kinds of initiatives. It involves uh, economic, uh, certainly many military uh, programs, uh, cultural initiatives, uh, all designed to both portray China, to demonize China, to make China out to the American people as a, as a force that's, that's adverse to their own interests. As an academic, I find one of the most disturbing parts of this document to be the way in which it subordinates academia, uh, supposedly the bastion of uh, freedom of investigation and freedom of expression, to American national policy. Uh, the document lays out uh, the objectives of controlling the discourse about China, controlling the flow of information about China, and we can see this in recent actions such as the shutting down across the country of Confucius Institutes at many universities. And now this current campaign to demonize Chinese international students and scholars coming to America to study and do research. Uh, the, the closing off of these opportunities, the, the neo-isolationism uh, of the current uh, leadership uh, does not bode well for, for promoting understanding and friendship, which is a much more uh, viable and desirable future than one of uh, ongoing conflict. Indeed, as Americans, we should see China's rise as a, as a moment of opportunity. China is, is emerging once again, returning to patterns uh, that, are, that have deep historical precedents, patterns of being a major uh, uh, player in, uh, in, its, in its region, uh, a center of productivity, a center of cultural and intellectual uh, efflorescence. And we should welcome that. As Americans, we should, we should want and hope and seek to work together with the Chinese rather than to allow our political elites and media pundits to drive a wedge of, of hostility and anxiety between the American and the Chinese people. Uh, the United States is, uh, is on the verge of becoming a, a failed state, uh, and uh, in many ways uh, we can see that played out most clearly in the, in the pathetic response to the COVID-19 crisis uh, on the part of a, of a country and a system that treats health as a commodity, as a profit generating center, rather than a human right, a basic right, which is how it's been treated in China. In essence, then, what we need to work for is a pivot to peace, a pivot away from a path that leads to war. Our future as Americans, our future as citizens of planet Earth should be bound up intimately and in, and in links of friendship and cooperation with that of China, rather than through the aggressive hostility promoted uh, by the American government. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Next, I would like to invite uh, Mara Verhaden-Hilliard, a constitutional rights lawyer 
Mara, Mara is an expert in civil rights and civil liberties. Her groundbreaking litigation in support of protesters in opposition to racist policing practices in Washington, D.C. has led to far-reaching injunctive relief and legislation that has been called a potential model for the rest of the country. She will be speaking about the profound impact that the new U.S. and foreign policy has on civil rights and civil liberties uh, of the Chinese American community and the larger Asian American community. Welcome, Mara. Many thanks to the organizers of this extremely important webinar and to the speakers today. It's, it's a critical time for people to speak out and to come together. And I want to say with absolute certainty that what we are witnessing right now is a march towards war. The most important thing, though, is that we not sit back and act as silent witnesses as this unfolds. I'd like to take a moment to discuss civil rights, civil liberties, and the implications of this march towards war with China. The US government is reorienting its foreign policy and military policy to prioritize what's referred to as major power conflict. The military and foreign policy focus is being shifted away from the Middle East a part of the world that has already been laid waste by US foreign and military policy and is pivoted towards Asia with its sights set on China. The phrase major power conflict is most obviously a euphemism for world war. And there is a crucial domestic component in all wars and that's the demonization of the targeted population. We must look back to the last world war and discuss what happened to Japanese Americans, an egregious chapter in American history that's been rejected and rebutted in the decades since. Japanese Americans and other Asian Americans during World War II were demonized, they were subject to extreme racism, and they were stigmatized as agents of Japan. There was a constant theme in this country that Japanese Americans were the enemy within. The racism and demonization was not only saturating through American society, but it was official policy of the US government. And as most people know, President Franklin Roosevelt issued an executive order, uh, that was Executive Order 9066, which resulted in the terrorizing roundup of people of Japanese descent, theft of their assets and belongings, destruction of their careers, businesses, and lives, and their placement in concentration camps inside the United States. At that time, the FBI arrested thousands of community and religious leaders. They raided people's private homes. They seized people's property and claimed it was contraband. This was the official policy of the United States from 1942 to 1945. And in the lead up to this, and during that time, over and over again, Military officials and politicians testified, told the American public falsely over and over again about the supposed threats and plans of Japanese Americans and people of Japanese descent and the threat they posed to the country. Now later, too much later, this was all exposed as lies. And now we have a rising tide of hate crimes against Asian Americans Chinese Americans in this country. The FBI is carrying out investigations in every state. Chinese students are being targeted. Academics and scientists of Chinese descent are under attack. We are told everywhere we turn that we can't trust Chinese people and people of Chinese descent. We are told that we must be on alert, that we can't trust our classmates, that we can't trust our neighbors. The director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, just this past week announced that the FBI was opening a new China-related domestic investigation every 10 hours, and that there are thousands of current investigations ongoing in the United States. This has to be understood, and it's important that people do understand that this is a replication of the pattern that played out in that last major power conflict of World War II. 
It's very easy for all of us to look in the rearview mirror of history and tell ourselves we would never have gone along with extreme racism, that we would have rejected any witch hunt, that we would have stood up, that we would have fought back against attacks on our classmates, that we would have stopped attacks on our coworkers, on our neighbors, that we would never have gone along with that tide of demonization and racism. But the only thing that really matters is actually what we do right now, what we do right now. And all of us who are in the legal community who say that we believe in civil rights, who say that we believe in civil liberties, and who do genuinely, in fact, fight for civil rights and fight for civil liberties, we have to stand with Chinese Americans and with people of Chinese descent, with the Asian American community, and we have to reject this racist witch hunt. And we have to do it now. We have to reject it actively. We have to reject it loudly. We have to reject it with words and with actions. This racism is part of the demonization that is necessary to convince the American public and soften them up on the path towards war. We have to understand it for what it is. We must join together to stop this march towards war and the hate and racism that is part and parcel of it. The pivot to peace is really also a pivot against racism. And I'm glad to join with all of those who are coming together in the pivot to peace at this most critical time. So thank you and thank you to everyone who is here today. Thank you, Mara. I would like to bring on Dr. Jill Stein next. Jill Stein was the 2016 presidential nominee for the Green Party. Jill Stein is an internationally recognized activist in the cause uh, for peace. Her courageous stance challenging militarism and war has been an inspiration for people around the country. She has also, as a consequence, had to contend with current new Cold War politics that seek to silence and intimidate those who want to speak up and speak out for a new U.S. foreign policy. Welcome, Jill. Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here today to launch the Pivot to Peace. This is not only a pivot away from war with China, which could easily become nuclear World War III that destroys civilization. It's also a pivot away from the domestic effects of war here at home, that is racism and poverty. These are the costs of not only war, but of simply preparing for war. As Martin Luther King noted in his Beyond Vietnam speech, these things all go together, what he called the triple evils of militarism, racism, and economic exploitation. They come as a package and they must be overcome as a package. From my perspective as a grandmother, community member, a medical doctor, it's very clear to me that our health, our democracy, our very survival depend on this pivot to peace. Already in the course of the U.S. run-up to war with China, each of Martin Luther King's triple evils are at crisis levels. Militarism is off the charts. The U.S. military budget is larger than the next biggest 10 or so military budgets combined, and it consumes over half the U.S. discretionary budget, maintaining 800 bases around the world, deploying special forces in 149 countries, perpetrating some 68 regime change events since World War II alone. This has not made the world a safer, more humane and democratic place. To the contrary, it's created a lot of failed states, mass refugee migrations, worse terrorist threats, and it's a major driver of climate change with the US military being the single largest source of greenhouse gases the world over. Big military budgets invariably bankrupt social infrastructure that's essential to meet human needs here at home. These needs were extraordinary even before the pandemic. Now with COVID-19, we're in a true state of emergency in which job loss peaked at an astounding 46 million jobs lost, 27 million people lost health care, nearly half of renters are now at risk for eviction, which is absolutely staggering. And the number of families with below poverty earnings has soared, especially Blacks and Latinos, even as the wealth of U.S. billionaires grew by an obscene half a trillion dollars. And in addition, anti-Asian racism 
is skyrocketing with the scapegoating of China in the effort to blame, to deflect blame for US negligence of its own for the COVID-19 crisis here in the United States. The physical violence and verbal abuse have surged with a recent report documenting over 2,100 incidents that have occurred since March alone. So putting it all together with these triple evils exploding, there's a lot of work to do. It's not easy to stop the war machine of the most powerful empire in the history of the world, but it's been done. Grassroots mobilizations, remember, they forced an end to the wars in Vietnam and Iraq. People to people networking in the United States and Russia, especially among physicians, helped overcome Cold War propaganda and enabled the development of critical nuclear weapons treaties. So we've done this before and we can do it again. And this is a great time to mobilize. This is an historic moment of converging, accelerating crises. And it's also a time of unprecedented uprising with massive protests against police brutality and white supremacy, a surge in labor strikes, rent boycotts, mutual aid networks, pipeline resistance, and much more. Given the conditions that people are facing, this uprising is not going away. So it's a very good time to be organizing for change and stopping the trajectory towards war with China is absolutely essential for this change. One other point about information warfare, because it's a big part of what we have to overcome. This, as you know, is laying the groundwork for war with China through a variety of disinformation campaigns right now, most recently around COVID-19. It's helpful to remind people that the sources of this disinformation, US intelligence agencies and mainstream media, have a very clear track record of promoting devastating propaganda for which we and the world are paying an inordinate, staggering, and unbearable price. These players have absolutely zero credibility. The Vietnam War was justified, you may recall, by the Gulf of Tonkin attack on US ships, but this attack never happened. The invasion of Kuwait in the first Gulf War in 1990 was prepared, was propelled by outrage, by, by outrage against the supposed murder of incubator babies by Iraqi soldiers. A completely fabricated story delivered in congressional testimony by a supposed witness, a young girl who later was revealed to be the carefully coached daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States. The whole story was complete nonsense. The 2003 invasion of Iraq was justified by the WMDs, and we all know how that went. And to top this all off, you may have heard, and if you haven't, you ought to know, that Mike Pompeo himself stated publicly on April 24th of last year, barely more than a year ago at Texas A&M University, he said, and I quote, I was CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we stole, like we had entire training courses. He said this amid his self-amused chuckles. Do we need to say anything more? Add to that, it used to be technically illegal for intelligence agencies to use propaganda against the US population. Even this minimal protection was repealed in 2013. So disinformation is alive and well, and it helps to remind people who don't know what's actually going on here. Having been targeted by one of those disinformation campaigns myself, I can tell you, these disinformation campaigns don't stand up to the light of day, and they are a badge of honor if you have one generated against you. It means you're getting somewhere. So don't let the disinformation or the threat of it be used against you or deter you. Our job is to engage the debate. Once the conversation starts, truth and justice take on a life of their own and the cause of peace is unstoppable. I look forward to the road ahead on this pivot to peace. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Thank you, Jill. Next, I would like to invite up Eugene Perrier. Uh, Eugene is a show host of the news channel Breakthrough News. Eugene will speak to us about the hypocrisy in mainstream media and the general media blackout 
on anything related to China that is not being bolstered, uh, that is not bolstering the demonization of China. Welcome, Eugene. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Sheila. And first and foremost, I just want to say on behalf of our entire Breakthrough News team, uh, I'm very honored to be here with such an august panel uh, of individuals across the country uh, here to launch Pivot to Peace. I, I think this is an absolutely critical initiative for you know all of the reasons you've already heard so far on this program. The relationship between China and the United States going into the 21st century is really one of such great import when it comes to all of the major challenges that are facing the world today, whether it be climate change, public health on a global scale, income inequality. I mean, really, what the relationship between the United States and China ends up being will have a profound impact, not only in the people of the United States, not only on the people of China, but really on the people of the world. So this is a question that is extremely, extremely critical. And it's been famously said that truth is the first casualty of war. And I think that we've already seen that in the context of the rising Cold War atmosphere against China. I mean, the free flow of information is the basis of empowered political activity. And already in the media climate in the United States, the uh, you know, disregarding of Chinese sources, the accepting of essentially any claim, um, regardless of the veracity of many of the individuals that are putting it forward, really the journalistic standards that you see here. And this is really consistent with what we've seen throughout the history of the United States in past cold wars and past hot wars, is that what, what immediately happens when things get divided between us and them enemies and friends, is that the perspective of the country that has been deemed the adversary is completely and totally wiped out. But how can anyone in America make a valuable judgment or make an informed judgment on what the policy of the United States should be towards any country, but certainly towards China, without real knowledge of what's going on in China, what the perspectives of Chinese people are, how the Chinese diaspora around the world historically, and including in this country, has developed as an important part of the history of the United States. This is not just a question of the next 100 years, but it's a question of the past hundreds of years and a relationship that's been forged, the importance of Chinese Americans to the culture of so much of this country. I mean, there's so much rich history, rich context on both sides of the equation that if they're completely unknown, of course, will, enable, will not enable anyone to make an informed judgment. And so from the perspective of what we have seen in our work at Breakthrough News is it's been critically important to do what we can to try to get beyond the headlines, to try to go into that which should be known and which is unknown about all of when we see the racial slurs being used around the COVID-19 pandemic. It's so easily picked up in many ways because there's almost no real knowledge of how the pandemic or what we know so far, quite frankly, because we don't know everything about how the pandemic has developed, about how different countries responded. And in fact, China's response, which the whole world has praised as being so robust, has now become widely known in the United States as somehow being laggard or behind or, 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 or deficient in some way, almost a complete flip on what the actual facts show us when we examine the record when it comes to what we've seen so far with this global pandemic. So we can see, I think, in just these few examples, just many of the things that you've heard here tonight, which are things that many of you may be saying, I wish I had known that before. How did I not know that? That's very important context for me. And the fact that that isn't in the mainstream of what's being discussed in this country is the problem. And the problem really is rooted in the fact that even the media has been swept up in this war hysteria. And rather than an objective look at the facts, we have attempts to blame and attempts to turn people against one, against, uh, against one another, both in between countries and in between uh, you know, those of us here in the United States as well. This is a poisonous, poisonous issue of racism that often flows from any war that has happened in this country's history. And certainly in the Cold War here rising, we're seeing racism against anyone deemed to be Chinese rising here in this country. We should also deeply, deeply concern us. And the roots of this are, are, are so diffuse. I, I could say so much about it because really the relationship between the United States and China, as I said at the outset, really touches at the core concerns of what kind of world we're gonna have going into the 21st century. One of cooperation, where there is peace between nations, where the major challenges facing us as human beings, as a species, are confronted, climate change, 
income inequality, poverty. Uh, I mean, so many of the things that we know, war in general, that afflict this world so terribly. Either we're going to have a century that moves beyond that, a century of cooperation, or a century of continued war and continued deprivation. And I think ultimately the only way for us to avoid that is a strong free flow of information, a strong understanding. And I think all those of us who are journalists, it's obviously our role to be able to provide the information for average everyday people to know what's really going on, to determine for themselves what sort of policies this country could be pursuing. And certainly from my own point of view personally, I think that would be a move away from a warlike mentality. So again, I'm very honored to be here, very happy to be able to participate in this launching of Pivot to Peace. I think that all of this information, I hope uh, you use your own voice and your own social media to share this with other individuals that you know so that we can start start to break down the barriers of misunderstanding between the United States and China. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eugene. Next, I would like to bring up Anne Wright. Anne Wright is a retired U.S. Army colonel and a retired U.S. State Department official. She resigned on March 19, 2003 in opposition to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. We're happy to have you, Anne. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and thank you for everyone who is uh, organizing this. As Mara said a little bit earlier, uh, we are um, approaching a war. Uh, when you look at the number of US military um, um, task force, naval task force that are out in the Western Pacific and that are doing what they call freedom of movement, freedom of the seas, uh, exercises, which are essentially a predecessor to uh, potentially war. We have two U.S. aircraft carrier groups out there, the USS Ronald Reagan and the USS Nimitz. And with each one of those giant uh, aircraft carriers come 10 different uh, ships as a part of their carrier task force. Uh, there are a number, we don't know for sure how many, but at least six nuclear submarines that are out in the Western Pacific, some of them having just left Guam. Uh, I live in Hawaii, and right now we are preparing for the protests for the largest U.S. or the largest military naval war practice in the world. It's called Rim of the Pacific. And every two years, the United States Navy gets navies from all over the world. 20 countries come and bring their ships to the waters off Hawaii to practice war. Because of a lot of citizen outrage and also because of COVID-19, uh, the U.S. military has had to reduce the numbers of days that this exercise or this war practice is going on. It's going down from six weeks to two and a half weeks in the latter part of August. It is, it is a war game, a war practice that we are opposing and we hope that you all will oppose it also. I'll try to share uh, something on the screen that will show what we're... We have a big petition that is to cancel RIMPAC, cancel the RIM of the Pacific, and the over 200 ships and aircraft uh, and personnel, over 20,000 military personnel participated in it two years ago. Now we've gotten the governor of the state of Hawaii to tell the Navy, don't let any of those ships come into the Hawaiian waters. So those will not be coming in, but the ground crews for all of them, over 500 people will be. So the the issue of military confrontation is very very real with those two carrier task force there and also with the u.s military now pivoting from europe to to the pacific to asia and the pacific and they're going to be moving their war games their war practice that they call defender 2020 which are over in europe this year they're going to be moving defender 2021 uh, to the Pacific and to Asia. So the United States government is definitely gearing up for a war, a war that we, of course, cannot, cannot have. This is the 75th uh, anniversary commemoration of another war, of the dropping of atomic bombs by the United States on Japan and the horrific 
horrific uh, uh, damage that was done psychologically, I think, to the whole world, that the use of these nuclear weapons on people. And when we look at what the U.S. military strategy is now saying, that tactical nuclear weapons may be a part of uh, any confrontation the U.S. uses. So it's very important that we um, really look at what is happening uh, in Asia and the Pacific and what the United States is doing on its military side of it. So I thank you all very, very much for organizing this. And please, the pivot, the pivot to peace is what we need, not the pivot to war. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you so much, Anne. Next, I would like to invite Mike Wong. Mike Wong is a retired social worker, a veteran, and a member of Veterans for Peace. Mike will speak to us about why veterans oppose this new Cold War. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Veterans for Peace is made up of combat veterans, war resistors, and people who served either in peacetime or in gray areas where they may have been witness to operations that were covert and short of overt war. The members of Veterans for Peace have been to battlefields, they've been to jails, they've been in exile, and to us, war is very real. And the destruction and the suffering of war is very real. Now the United States is trying to impose our will, as we have on so many countries in the world, on China. And China is a nation that has lifted 99% of its population out of extreme poverty in the space of about 40 years. This is unprecedented. It is called an economic miracle, even by US economists. And the United States keeps portraying China as an oppressive society that silences its population, but in fact, opinion polls as well as first-hand reports show that the population of, the, of China has a 90% approval rate of its present government. The United States talks about human rights and democracy, but you think about Iraq, Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Vietnam, and so many other countries where we did not respect human rights. We have overthrown more democracies in the world than any other country by far. No other country even comes close. The US has started a second Cold War with a major arms race and a nuclear arms race in Asia and involving all of the nations of Asia as much as they can, building bases, encircling China, uh, stoking paranoia. And we're starting a new arms race with nuclear weapons that are much more complicated and counter weapons in which the risk of war is much greater than even Cold War I, where we had numerous close calls. The pivot to peace is the only alternative to war. We are not doing this because we care about, the United States is not doing this because it cares about human rights or democracy. It wants to undermine and destroy China, just like it has done in the Middle East. In 5,000 years of Chinese history, China has only fought wars on its borders. It has never gone all far afield and trying to conquer the world, in spite of the fact that about a thousand years ago, China invented gunpowder 400 years before anyone else, and yet it did not use that to try to conquer the world. So this is why I support the, the pivot to peace. I support peace and coexistence, which is what China is advocating. This is the only way for the world and both our nations to survive in the long term. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. 
Next, I would like to invite up KJ No. KJ is a peace activist and scholar. He will be discussing the media portrayal uh, efforts to demonize China, including China's handling of COVID-19. Welcome, KJ. Thank you. And I'm going to be presenting a little bit about the specifics of COVID and the way in which it has actually been weaponized. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is share with you my screen. And the first thing I'd like to do is tell you about the five big lies. The five big lies are that China engineered the virus or that China leaked the virus somehow by accident. There's also the lie that China covered up the virus. And this has four different variations that it silenced whistleblowers, that it withheld knowledge of human to human transmission, it withheld knowledge of the genome, and that it didn't notify the rest of the world in a timely fashion. And then there's also the lie that China spread the virus deliberately, that it's still covering up the virus, and that it is opportunistically weaponizing the virus by hoarding PPE or by disrupting supply chains. So I'd like to show you that if we look at the timeline, we'll see that most of these lies uh, can be seen for what they are, that they really don't have any validity. And the first, I'd like to show you a little timeline here. And if we can see here, we can see that the first uh, outbreaks were somewhere between December 1st and December 8th. These are the confirmed outbreaks. They are allegations of earlier outbreaks, but these actually have not been confirmed and some are considered to be bacterial infections, some are considered to be pneumonic plague. So this is the best estimate that we have. And we also note that on July, on December 21st, we started to see the first cluster of patients. And then if we look on July, on December 27th, we see that a Dr. Zhang Jixiang notifies the hospital of an unusual cluster of viral pneumonia. This goes to the Hubei Provincial Hospital, which convenes experts. They start a field investigation, and that results in a public health announcement on December 30th. And from that point, the Chinese government notifies the World Health Organization. And on January 1st, the US CDC is notified. Now, if we look at the sequence, we can uh, debunk the allegation that there was some kind of cover up. The cover up comes from an article from the New York Times that alleges that an ophthalmologist by the name of Li Wenliang notified his colleagues in a private chat. And that hardly rises to the level of whistleblowing. But they allege that this information was suppressed. As we can see here, the actual notification, which was done by a professional, was by Dr. Zhang. And this was three days prior to Dr. Li Wenliang. So that argument does not hold. Another argument that is made, and this is by the Associated Press, is that human-to-human -human transmission information was suppressed. In order to do that, we have to look at the first outbreak. We had the first cluster, and then we start to see uh, the first casualty. This was on January 9th. This was a man who was 61, and he had multiple comorbidities. He passed away on January 9th. And on January 14th, his wife contracted COVID. So this is the first confirmed human-to-human -human transmission. 
And then on January 20th, Zong Nanshan, the public health expert, announces sustained human-to-human -human transmission. Now, the AP article alleges that during the six-day period from the 14th to the 16th, the Chinese sat on this information and this caused devastating harm to the rest of the world. What they fail to acknowledge is that there is a distinction between limited human to human transmission as would happen within a family uh, that is sharing a bed, that is sharing food, that is sharing the environment, that is spending all the time together and sustained human to human transmission is what we really want to be watching out for when we are taking epidemic precautions. Uh, if we don't make a distinction between these two, then any outbreak of hepatitis or STDs would be cause for massive lockdown. So this is a clearly um, a disingenuous argument, but AP glosses over the distinction, and that is uh, why people are liable to be confused around this. The third lie is that a China has withheld knowledge of the genome. Now, there were early sequences of the genome that were done before or late in December, but really the first uh, sequence that was uploaded to GenBank, which is a public virus data bank, was on January 1st. So the allegation is that the information was withheld and if we look at the timeline again, we can see that the Chinese government um, gave uh, information about the human to human transmission on the 20th. On the 22nd, people in Wuhan were told to wear masks. On the 23rd, there was a total quarantine of the city of Wuhan. All outbound traffic was frozen. And then on the 25th, there were 10 provinces that declared a public health emergency. New Year's events were canceled. Five cities were quarantined and 58 million people were affected. And Xi Jinping declared it was a grave situation. Now, if that was not warning enough to the United States, we also know that there were the red dawn emails that were circulating on January 29th. And in one of these emails, Peter Navarro warned that there would be 500,000 people dead in the United States from uh, COVID. And on the 30th, the WHO declared a global health emergency and hu health and human services, uh, Alexander Azar, uh, warned that there would be a pandemic. So once again, we can see that this information was widely circulated. It was widely known at the highest levels of the US government. So to allege that China had somehow withheld this information or that it is silenced whistleblowers, none of this information upholds. But there are actually endless variations of these lies. They've all have been debunked or shown to be without merit. But as you can see, we can easily debunk these from timelines and public announcements. This ties into the current situation that we're at, which has to do with the idea of narrative dominance of information warfare under full spectrum dominance. The key point that these lies are trying to allege is that the virus is China's responsibility. And this has to do with the fact that China's been declared a revisionist power, i.e. an official enemy. And this is part of the gray zone warfare, the hybrid warfare, the information warfare that is happening. So we are facing a very transitional point in, uh, in global affairs. And we have to be aware that these lies, have a tremendous effect. I will leave you with a quote from William Casey. He said, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. And those who would have you believe absurdities are preparing you 
for atrocities. In war, the first casualty is truth. And I'll leave you with one last saying, a Chinese saying, derive truth from facts. Thank you. Thank you, KJ. Next, I would like to invite Brian Becker. Brian is the National Director of the Answer Coalition, and he will be speaking with us today about the new military doctrine. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you to everyone who's joined with us today for this inaugural launch of Pivot to Peace, the alternative to what President Obama declared in 2011 when he was visiting Australia, he called it the pivot to Asia. But we can see now that the pivot to Asia is nothing more than a pivot to confrontation, a pivot to conflict, a pivot to war. The fact that the Pentagon, shortly after Donald Trump assumed the White House in 2017, announced a new military doctrine slash policy identifying major power conflict, which as Mara said, is nothing more than a euphemism for world war, that this indeed would be the United States new doctrine. There was no debate. There was no debate in Congress. There was no debate in academia. There was certainly no deb debate in the mainstream corporate owned media, which functioned as nothing more than an echo chamber for the new military doctrine. And now we have a situation where all of military budgeting, military contingency planning, military prioritization, the deployment of naval ships, the deployment of Air Force aircraft, the orientation of the new US Space Force, all designed not simply to fight a major power, not only to engage in a major power conflict, but to win a major power conflict. And so we have here in the last few years, again, without debate, the revival of a concept that emerged shortly after World War II, when the United States had a monopoly on nuclear weapons and thus had military supremacy, that war with the Soviet Union, the other major power at that time, was one, inevitable, and secondly, that the war could be won. That the war with the Soviet Union, even if it was a nuclear war, even if it was a war that took the lives of hundreds of millions of people, would allow the United States to come out victorious. And the fact that this became the official doctrine of the United States shortly after World War II also created a response, a movement, a peace movement, an anti-nuclear movement, a movement of people in the United States and around the world who said no, who said no to the idea of major power conflict, no to the idea of a winnable nuclear war. And during that time period, a formidable mass movement developed here in the United States and globally. And that movement, along with a changed position of relationships or the relationship of military forces between the United States and the Soviet Union and then the United States and China in the 1950s, created the conditions whereby instead of going forward with major power conflict, meaning World War III, there was a whole variety of international arms agreements, nuclear test bans, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1969, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Range Missile Treaty that was adopted in, 19, in the mid-1980s. There was the SALT Treaty, the STAR Treaty, the whole architecture so that instead of global war, devastating, catastrophic World War III, that the relationship between the United States and other major powers would be a managed rivalry, a rivalry that would avoid catastrophe, would avoid a war that would call into question 
the very existence of the human species. And what we've seen in the last 20 years and what we see happening with great dynamism today is that all of those international arms agreements, those treaties, that entire scaffolding or architecture to manage rivalry so that it did not end up in, in major power conflict, all of that has been extinguished, ripped up, eviscerated, and replaced with a new doctrine of major power conflict, and again, without debate. The task of the pivot to peace is to start the debate. It should have started three years ago. There needs to be an informed debate. There needs to be an understanding of what the real issues is, are. There needs to be an understanding of what China wants. There needs to be an understanding of what the real dynamic and fundamental objectives of US foreign policy actually are. What the policymakers in the Pentagon and some of the chief hawks in Congress are hoping is that by demonizing China, it will take the place of an informed debate. If you demonize the enemy sufficiently, if you create enough hatred towards the enemy in such quantities, you don't have to uh, be involved in an informed debate because all you need to know is who you're going to hate and who you're going to fight. We have to stop this madness. We have to stop this insanity. We have to start that kind of an informed debate, not later, not when it's too late. We need to start it right now. That's the purpose of our webinar today, to pivot to peace, to initiate and to demand the initiation of an informed debate everywhere, in the media, in Congress, throughout society. And I think if we have that space, that debate, we will be joined by millions of Americans who say, no, we don't want war with China. We don't want uh, animosity. We don't want to breed hatred between our two peoples and our two countries. That in fact, we need to cooperate. We need to facilitate and build cooperation and build solidarity. We have a common foe right now in COVID-19, but we also have a common foe with environmental change and global warming. We have a common foe with the whole concept of militarism as the way to solve the world's problems. And so we've come together as the pivot to peace to begin this process. It's an important process. I would say it's the most important. It's a task of historic monumental consequences. And we ask everyone who's watching this webinar to go to our website, Pivot to Peace's website, which is called peacepivot.org, peacepivot.org. Look at our mission statement. It's very simple. We need peace, not war with China. Peace and friendship and respect rather than animosity, confrontation, and war. And when you go to the website, sign the mission statement, show your support, join us in this new peace movement, join us as if your life and our lives and the life of the planet depend on it, because in fact, that is the reality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so that concludes our speakers for today. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers for joining us today to urge for peace and not war against China. We wanna build a global peace movement where cooperation and friendship is at the forefront. I want to emphasize again that the mission of the Pivot to Peace is to provide a space and platform for those throughout US society who are deeply troubled by the new US military and foreign policy doctrine. Uh, a doctrine that puts the country on the course of major power conflict. The urgent need at the moment is for a thoroughgoing debate about the new military doctrine. The demonization of China is being used as a substitute for a genuine informed discussion and debate about US foreign policy. Demonization is designed to create an atmosphere where open discussion and debate is considered untenable or even dangerous. From our point of view, the rush towards major power conflict, especially when American people 
do not know the issues and are simply being spoon-fed sound bites that demonize China is both untenable and dangerous. We, as people of conscience, are standing together to say that above all else, we should give peace a chance. In fact, we should make peace the priority. We should pivot towards peace, and we are committed to educating and mobilizing public opinion exactly for this purpose. So once again, we appeal to you to stay connected and show your support for our Pivot to Peace. Please sign our mission statement at peacepivot.org. And you can also follow us on Twitter at Peace Pivot and on Instagram at Pivot to Peace. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you once again for all of our speakers. Have a wonderful afternoon.